Thank you very much, Theo. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening or whatever time of day it is, wherever you are. Uh, it gives me great pleasure today to be um, introducing Dr. Patricia Southoff. We're sort of welcoming her back to SOAS, of course, at Zoom, but she's an alumna of SOAS. Uh, and I was on her PhD supervisory committee, which was uh, very interesting, a lot of fun, because it was a it's about as esoteric as they get, I think, that that the, the subject of, of Patricia's PhD, which is Chomaka, these kind of esoteric uh, communicatory uh, symbols, sort of hand gestures and stuff um, in tantric texts in particular, the Swachanda Tantra. Um, since completing her PhD, she worked on as a postdoctoral fellow on the Ayurveda project, which we've had a fair amount of engagement with, because of course it was another ERC project that went on at the same time as the Hatha Yoga project. And that was the Ayurveda project has sort of led her into the subject that she's going to be talking to us about today. And now Patricia is assistant lecturer at the University of Alberta in Edmonton in Canada. And her book, congratulations, or I was at the, uh, the online launch the other day, has just come out. Uh, Illness and Immortality, Mantra, Mandala and Meditation in the Natra Tantra, um, which is all about healing rites in medieval Shaiba Tantra. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, Patricia. Theo's given us all the all, all we need to know about the Slido and so forth, and I'll be back for questions at the end. And the title of the lecture is Holy Man Pharmacist, Tantra and Alchemical Medicine. So thanks very much, Patricia, for agreeing to give a talk, and over to you. All right, let me get my screen sharing happening. Okay, uh, thank you, first of all, to those of you who made it to the live session. Um, I see some old friends and some family, and uh, thank you, I appreciate you coming. I'm also really excited to give this talk at SOAS, um, and thank you to Jim and the Center for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be back at SOAS, even if uh, only virtually. So <clears throat> in approximately the seventh century of the common era, we start to find Sanskrit medical, religious, and yoga texts, uh, which begin to make unambiguous references to mercury as this ingestible or topical agent. And when applied correctly, mercury can bring about health, longevity, immortality, and liberation. Now, traditionally, mercury has been considered to have an even longer history. Uh, the word in Sanskrit is rasa, and we find this term in both the Charaka Samhita and the Sushruta Samhita, so two very early medical works. Um, and it, here it is a substance that can cure all disease. However, in Sanskrit, rasa can also refer to the sap or juice of plants, liquids, uh, liquor, sugar cane, and various minerals or metals. <clears throat> so even though the 12th century commentator on the Sushruta Dalhana does interpret rasa to be mercury, there's no evidence of mercurial usage in medicine at such an early stage of Ayurvedic development. We also don't have any local sources identified for Indian mercury, and that indicates that it was likely an important substance. So if we assume that mercury was introduced to India during the seventh century, its introduction occurs around the same time as the beginning of tantric literary production. So like medicinal uses of mercury and cannabis, dubious efforts have been made to trace tantric traditions to early periods, including the time of the Buddha, ancient Hindu sages, and even the first settlements of the humans in the Indus Valley. But the earliest references we have to tantric practitioners uh, occurs around the second century. And these Kapalikas are skull bearing tantric practitioners who engaged in charnel ground rituals. They first appear in a Prakrit poem written between the third and fifth century. A seventh century reference to a tantric practitioner suffering from the use of improperly purified mercury um, appears in the Kadambari. <clears throat> this reaffirms the dating and introduction of Mercury to India and demonstrates this early connection with Tantra and Tantric practitioners. So in this presentation, I will focus almost exclusively on Tantra and alchemy, which is called Rasa Shastra in the Sanskrit literature. There are Indian, 
and Tibetan vernacular traditions that include Tantra and alchemical references. But the connections between these traditions and the Sanskrit corpus of Rasa Shastra literature remain to date largely explored. Rasa Shastra and the Sanskrit tradition itself has been long under-examined. And of the nearly 40 works of Rasa Shastra that Mellenbold in, examines in his encyclopedic history of Indian medical literature, none have been critically edited and translated. So until we get this work begun and underway, cross-cultural and cross-language connections are going to remain elusive. <clears throat> References to Sanskrit medical or San yes. Just interrupt for a second. I don't know if you want to play your slideshow and then we get the full screen. Oh, uh, no, because then it'll hide my notes and I won't be able okay. to see them. Okay, sure. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Okay, fine. Sorry. No, no worries. Um, so the references to Sanskrit uh, med medicinal ingestion of mercury date to about the seventh century. The Rasa Shastra literature are works of alchemy by alchemists. So they're for alchemists to do these processes. And they start to appear beginning with the Rasa Hridaya Tantra in about the 10th century. This coincides again with the development of the later Tantric Kaula traditions at a time when they're de-emphasizing charnel ground practice, replacing it instead with a focus on eroticism, the attainment of supernatural powers through yoga, and initiatory practices. Uh, these works, especially Abhinavagupta's Tantra Loka, play minimal attention to the long tradition of tantric medicine that ultimately traces itself back to the Atharva Veda. So from approximately the sixth century on, you have Bhuta, Bala, and Garuda Tantra. And these focus on the treatment of a variety of illnesses from demonic possession, pediatrics, childhood possession, and snake bites. These works utilize a combination of herbal and ritual treatments to provide medical cures. The ninth century Bhairava Tantra, the Netra Tantra, doesn't offer any, uh, excuse me, any herbal recipes, but it does describe the use of mantra, mandala, and meditation to imbue medicines with healing power. Scholars often focus on the philosophical developments of Tantra, uh, but up to now really ignore its lasting influence in the medico religion. This is where Rasa Shastra enters. These early works adopt the language of the Kaula, especially these, the understanding and use of mantras as required for alchemical success in mercurial operations, orifaction, and to increase the effectiveness of plant and mineral medicines. So at the center of this worship, we find Rasa Bhairava and Rasa Kusha. And these are developed from the tantric deities Svachanda Bhairava and Tripura Sundari. So the 11th to 12th century Rasarnava places the knowledge of Mercury above all others. So we can see from this quote here, we have excavational knowledge. So this knowledge that allows one to cross the ocean of poverty is the lowest uh, portal knowledge. So here we have the mantric ritual that unlocks the seals to the subterranean worlds, the middle. Mantric knowledge is the highest, but mercurial knowledge is the most high. So through the knowledge of mantra, tantra, and rasa yoga, transgressions disperse. Having destroyed all hells, one collects <clears throat> virtue. So knowledge of Mercury is the highest knowledge in the three worlds. It's very difficult to obtain because it produces enjoyment and liberation. So the Rasarnava also teaches, also designates itself as the highest and most difficult to obtain Tantra uh, because it teaches one how to attain perfection and gives both liberation and enjoyment. In addition to teaching the worship of the Rasalinga, which we have here, the text also uses tantric archetypal model of a dialogue between Shiva and Parvati. So at the beginning of the work, Parvati praises Bhairava as the leader of the Kaula, the Maha Kaula, the Siddha Kaula, etc. lineages. 
So this again makes a clear connection between Tantra and alchemy. <clears throat> These Rasa Shastra texts do present themselves to be a largely indigenous tradition. Uh, they include almost no references to non-Sanskrit or even non-alchemical Sanskrit works. But it would be foolish to believe that there are no outside influences. A 13th to 15th century Rasasara, for example, explicitly does state that the process for coloring mercurial process, products were taught to the author by Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhists. So this and the translation of numerous Sanskrit works into Tibetan indicates a strong exchange of ideas and techniques. To date, studies on the connections between Indian and Chinese alchemical traditions are rare. Uh, but there is a major point of interest uh, in the connections between substances and sexual fluids. In China, alchemists associate mercury with menstrual blood and sulfur with semen. So you have the mercurial feminine yin uh, with the, and the physical properties of mercury as a substance that dissolves and softens and the sulfuric masculine yang dries and hardens. This is the opposite in Rasa Shastra. Here we have mercury helping to produce semen when properly purified, and it is associated with the semen of Shiva himself. Sulfur is taught to cleanse the blood and works to regulate menstruation. So therefore, sulfur is connected to the menses of the assistant or the goddess. Further, cinnabar or mercuric sulfide is a divine manifestation of the sexual union between God and goddess in mineral form. <clears throat> so in both the Rasarnava and the Rasaratna Samuchaya, we find mythological accounts of the birth of Skanda. And these teach that the gods drank mercury to attain immortality. Fearful humans would use the substance for the same aims Shiva makes mercury impure, which makes it incapable of producing immortality. The texts also describe menstrual blood mixed with the nectar of immortality that can be used in the calcination and purification of mercury. So we have these gendered notions of substances, and they continue in the practice of alchemy, where you have a female assistant who is required <clears throat> for mercurial operations. So the male alchemist has to have the attributes of knowledge of the mantras, he devotion to Shiva and the goddess, patience, he must show bravery. Uh, the woman, the female alchemist, has to have curly black hair, lotus eyes, uh, a youthful, beautiful appearance. She should be endowed with large, heavy breasts. And her vulva must appear like the leaf of the sacred fig. Furthermore, she should menstruate in the waning half of the lunar month. So if such a woman is not available, because obviously this is a very perfected woman, uh, another woman who should be young and beautiful can act as a substitute. However, she must be fed a mixture of sulfur and ghee each morning for three weeks. So this woman is both partner and assistant in ritual, but not the core participant. As in the tantric ritual, women do participate directly in the alchemical processes. Uh, and they appear to do so perhaps as a, as a mother and a wife, as well as an assistant. So alchemy becomes part of this woman's domestic life. But this archetypal female-bodied alchemist uh, has the of the tantric goddess. Her very real menstrual blood is both alchemical ingredient and alchemical product. So she must possess this ideal goddess body. And if that body is not deemed up to standard, she has to ingest an unpleasant concoction of mineral sulfur mixed with a stomach soothing dairy. So here, ghee. The texts do imply that this woman is post pubescent. Uh, her breasts are full, she menstruates with regularity. And again, we have this leaf-like symmetry of her yoni that's very rep reminiscent of the tantric view of yoni as the mouth of the yogini. 
So where the vulva of the Kula Yogini offers knowledge during the initiation process, the alchemical woman's yoni produces a tangible substance that is to be used in alchemical process. Both Tantra and Rasa Shastra recognize the mystical power of the feminine as both woman and mother. <clears throat> so this creative power of femininity is harnessed through the inclusion of female sexual fluids in alchemical recipes. Shaman Hotley has identified seven types of tantric sexual practices. So love, magic, desire, fulfillment, uh, ritualized coitus, the tantric feast, initiatory coitus, sexual yoga, and individual sexual practice. So of these seven, love magic and individual sexual practices are the most prominent in Rasa Shastra literature. This love magic involves ritual practices that are meant to attract or subjugate a sexual partner, while individual sexual practice involves a retention, collection, or elimination of sexual fluids. Quite a few alchemical feature medical sections devoted to the suppression of ejaculation and the production of virility, and they include aphrodisiacs. So these recipes often appear in chapters on their own, but sometimes are intermingled with prescriptions for women's health. So things such as causing and preventing pregnancy, the removal of pubic hair, firming of the breasts, and reducing menstrual pain. Some of the works that include uh, the suppression of ejaculation or the production of virility recipes are the 15th century Rasa Ratnakara, the Rasa Sam Kalaketa, the Rasa Manjari, and quite a few others. We find diamonds quite often in the Rasa Shastra corpus. Uh, now, when these diamonds are used, they'll be calcinated. So they're not the rock hard diamond anymore. You'll get diamond ash. But when used in medicine, the diamond's gender has to conform to the gender of the person ingesting the medicine. So again, several works describe these three subtypes of diamonds. Um, and this applies to other gems as well, but it's most important in diamonds. So you have the male, the female, and a third gender that is described as third or neutral. And this just seems to describe a person who doesn't fit neatly into the male female binary. So these gendered properties do appear in all gems. The plume, the male diamond, is one that has eight edges, <clears throat> six angles, and resembles a rainbow. Its eight services are radiant and beautiful, and it contains no faults. The stree diamond is round, flat surfaced, and rough. And finally, the Napumsaka diamond has blunt angles and lacks roundness. So these diamonds are only effective if the type used matches the gender of the patient. In recipes for the subjugation of women, uh, we find a range from medical to mantric. These methods are found in the 16th century Rasa Manjari. And while well, Melanville describes the ninth chapter as one that, quote, describes subjects usually dealt with in Tantra about Satkarman, the only subjugation appears from that list of six. Uh, the text gives recipes to make a woman like a slave at night. This includes smearing ingredients such as honey, rock salt, camphor, quicksilver, saffron, and gold on the penis. We also have preparations that can be included in either the man or woman's food that include sandalwood, valerian, long pepper, and tamarind. Bathing a woman's genitals with embolic myrobalon after reciting a mantra seven times will also make her like a slave at night. We also find recipes for a version of female sexual pleasure. Uh, these call for odd ingredients, such as the dust stirred up by a donkey mixed with corpse ash and menstrual blood, 
or simply the dust of two fighting dogs. It doesn't really tell us what we do with that dust, um, but apparently it will kill a woman's sexual desire. We also find references to men who worship various yakshis, yakshinis uh, through mantra recitation and offering numerous plants, honey, clarified butter and milk to the goddesses. These goddesses then give the worshiper whatever he desires. So in addition to granting him all of his desires, they also offer rewards of gifts of soups and mantras with food, uh, long life, wealth, health, a serene mind, supernatural powers, youthful appearance, immortality, speech, revitalization of the dead, and good fortune. <clears throat> so in a work called the Kakasaputta, its 19th chapter focuses on raising the dead, knowing the time of death and sheeting death. Uh, these occur across the tantric uh, milieu. The Bhairava tantras like the Svachanda and Netra tantras discuss this. Uh, it comes up in various Buddhist works as well. So in each of these works, one attempts to conquer death in order to attain liberation. Now, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Kaksaputta is interested only in worldly gains. So making the aims of recita resuscitating, estimating the time of death and cheating death a medical rather than spiritual treatment. It calls for the uh, use of sage oil and guduchi, so very common ingredients in both Rasa Shastra and Ayurveda. So in order to revive the dead, and this means one who has died of disease or snake bite, one must worship a linga that he ties to a tree and he recites the Agora mantra for three hours each day and night. He then fills a pot that is also tied to the tree with ripe fruit and worships it with perfume, flawless flowers, and other substances. He places seeds smeared with borax into a wide-mouthed clay pot made by a woman. The vessel is then placed upside down into a copper bowl and rested in the sunshine. Finally, he puts about 55 grams of the prepared oil and the same amount of sesame oil into the nose of the corpse. In a second recipe, one mingles human semen and mercury with an equal part of the prepared oil to immediately bring the corpse back to life. That these works contain both mantra and mercurial medicine is not surprising considering the connection to both the earlier and contemporary mantra, uh, tantras. And this text uh, lists several works as its inspiration and includes quite a long list of tantras. Um, <laughs> excuse me. The mercury or quicksilver that's used in these recipes would have to have gone through the purification process. And the 10th century Rasa Hridaya Tantra describes in detail the steps for purifying mercury. So the first eight steps are used to purify mercury for medicine, and then the final 10 lead to immortality. So, so I have the list here. Um, you can see the entire list. And this is a screenshot from a series of videos made by Dagmar Wiastik and Andrew Mason, where they actually went through the first eight processes of purifying mercury. Um, I think they would have continued, but they started to include very expensive ingredients um, and our small grant was not going to fund that. Uh, because these works uh, directly reference the, uh, or because the Kaka Saputa directly references the Rasarnava, we have to call uh, the question of dating of both. The Kakasaputta is usually dated sometime around the 10th century, but if that's correct, that would have to move up the date of the Rasarnava from the widely accepted 11th or 12th centuries. But many passages from the Rasarnava are taken from earlier texts and sometimes paraphrased. 
So David Gordon White concludes, and I agree that this probably provides evidence of an orally transmitted tradition of Rasa Shastra and the use of common source materials. So perhaps in putting these works together, uh, the authors were, you know, bringing in knowledge that was pre-existing but not written down. The treatment of children within tantric and alchemical medicine is quite different from Ayurvedic treatments and focuses on the protection from a variety of female demons rather than medical remedies. So one of the earliest instances of this appears in a Buddhist text dating to approximately first half of the seventh century. In this yet unedited manuscript, we find the story of Buddha recounting a spell to ward off demon, demonic possession to protect his son from female demons. Illness caused by spirit possession and the medicalization of possession appear in Sanskrit literature from a very early stage. Uh, the Rig Veda calls on Agni to hear prayers and drive evil spirits from the body. And that verse focuses on illness, illnesses of possession that impact embryos and a woman's womb, which demonstrates a special risk of possession to women and fetuses. So as Fred Smith notes, there are two primary divisions of possession, so involuntary and voluntary. The former being the concern of Ayurvedic and Tantric healers, and the latter focuses on divination. Ayurvedic texts often associate madness and mental illness with possession. Acharka Samhita teaches that diseases caused by moral transgression can be treated with pacification rituals as well as medicine and recitation of the God's name, fire sacrifice, temple offerings, and more. Within the Rasa Shastra corpus, we're not given a reason for child possession, uh, but instead the symptoms and to whom to appeal for healing. So several tantric works, including Ravana's Bala Tantra, uh, discuss possession and pediatrics very clearly. The term Bala Tantra itself is often translated as midwifery, but it would be better translated childhood illnesses um, as works that focus on the rights of Bala Tantra very rarely mention the process of childbirth and instead highlight medicines before and after birth. Unfortunately, we don't have any texts really that focus solely on children's medicine, but we find references to possession within the tantric canon, especially the Bhuta and Bala Tantras. Uh, Michael Slover points out that the Garuda Purana contains a spell that is used to protect children that very closely matches spells found in other texts. The 16th century alchemical Rasa Manjari continues this tradition and it cites Ravana's Bala Tantra. However, comparing the published edition of the Bala Tantra attributed to Ravana and the Rasa Manjari, I've found very different lists of yoginis who must be appeased. Um, but these lists do match up with uh, the goddesses that cause possession in other works. The Russell Mandri doesn't really give us detailed instructions on how to appease the yoginis, but instead gives the name, direction of offering, and symptoms associated with them. Now, if you're looking through Rasa Shastra texts, you'll find the term yantra and yoga, and that might seem very exciting at first, but <laughs> a warning, yoga generally is a word used just in recipes, so it just means, you know, join these ingredients together. Um, aside from a text called the Ananda Khanda, uh, the term yantra really just means uh, the apparatuses that are used to create these so these yantras are jars, bottles, and ovens, things like that. The 21st chapter of the Ananda Kanda does offer a description of the treatment room as a dwelling with 12 pillars, a strong roof, and walls of bricks smeared with plaster. 
It teaches the builder to place the doors at the cardinal directions and install a 10 armed Bhairava who resembles a black cloud, has flaming erect hair. He holds a shovel, an ax, drum, hook, sword, tridents, and uses the mudra of wish granting. Uh, he's got a serpent, a noose, and is ringing a bell. He's got curved fangs, wears serpents as earrings, uh, and has sacred threads, a gold bracelet on his upper arm, and he conveys fear. So smeared in black and adorned with many malas, this Bhairava destroys death and venom, etc. The text goes on to describe in detail the iconography of various forms of Shiva, along with Bija mantras and the building of yantras using 8, 26, and 32 petals, along with the letters of the alphabet. So these yantra and mantra combinations provide medical treatment for eradicating misfortune, preventing sudden death, fear, disease, fainting, fever, etc. Uh, one who re receives this rejuvenative therapy within the hut is treated with both medicinal and mantric remedies for complete treatment. So again, it's really only in the Anandakanda, as far as I can tell, that you have tantric yantras. Everywhere else, we're really dealing with these apparatuses. So we know very little about the home and domestic life of the alchemist. He does have a temple, a laboratory, and a medicinal garden. So this indicates that he's a householder with a wife and a home. The wife, I'm assuming, is the assistant due to the very intimate nature of the substances that he uses from her body. The yantras and the ingredients for alchemical preparations can be quite costly. Uh, so the alchemist would need to live near enough town, a town or city, to procure ingredients. Uh, he also needs to attract clients, obviously, and presumably house a small library of Rasa Shastra instruction manuals. However, he does also need to be at enough distance from the city to Track of land on which to build all of these buildings and grow this garden. The processes of alchemy are also very time consuming. You have ingredients that are churned for days on end, mantras repeated over and over again, um, you know, while things are cooking on this ever roasting flame that needs constant care. So because this alchemist has been initiated, he knows the mantras, but he also makes the medicine. I believe that he appears to be more of a holy man pharmacist than a traditional Ayurvedic physician. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Thanks very much. That was fascinating. Beautifully illustrated. I haven't seen that last image either. Um, Great. So we've got a few questions on the Slido I saw, but um, I've got a couple, but I'll just start with one I mean, faintly technical, but you mentioned um, when you were talking about uh, alchemy and sexual practice, you mentioned there was uh, that uh, love magic dominated in there. So I'm just wondering if there's any, and that made me think more broadly about connections, but what, what sort of Kaula traditions, which of the, the various different streams of, of Kaulism uh, is alchemy uh, connected with? I mean, because the, the Nitya Tantras are the ones that teach love magic, which then obviously developed into the traditions of uh, Tripura Sundari and the Dakshinamaya. So I'm wondering if there is any direct sort of mapping onto uh, w whether there's a, any particular Amnaya or stream of Kaulism that is best represented within these uh, Rasa Shastra texts? That's a great question. You know, um, before you answer it, Patricia, oh. do you want to stop sharing your screen? Because as gorgeous as this image is, but it would be lovely to see you. <laughs> oh, sure. <Thank> you. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not sure that there is a particular stream that it's coming from. The texts are quite all over the place with their gods and goddesses. You know, some some are worshipping Parvati, uh, you know, 
you have Shiva, you have Ganesh appears in some. Um, some of these texts are also Jain, so they're not just Shiva works. Um, so I think there's a there's a lot of taking from various places in the tantric tradition, and I, I, as as of yet, I don't think we can draw that connection directly back. Okay. So not a just also follow not, on not the answer you're looking for. <laughs> And well, maybe if all these texts get edited, it might 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 make the answer more possible. Um, on that, well, connected, I suppose. And you said that um, the the you mentioned the alchemical traditions of Shaivism and Jainism. What about is there are there any Vaishnava alchemical texts that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of, no. And I wonder why that is, because obviously the Tantra similarly influenced Jainism and, and Vaishnavism. So I wonder why that might be. Um, OK, we've got a few questions on the Slido. I knew Lubomir would be asking a couple since this is an old interest <laughs> of his. And so if we could go to Lubomir, please, for his questions. Yes, good evening. Yeah, I would love to have a couple of questions but for now my first question would be on immortality uh, when reading alchemical texts many years ago i noticed that immortality is uh, quite uh, frequently mentioned in alchemical texts and he also to tonight uh, mentioned it as, as a as a goal of the uh, alchemical practice and um, uh, my question is quite simple what exactly means immortality in Indian alchemical texts. I mean, is it is it a physical immortality, the immortality of the physical material body or some other kind of immortality? So could you please uh, elaborate more on this? Yes, uh, absolutely. This? It's, it's a great question. And it is one that we definitely, um, you know, the texts vary, but the term itself is problematic um, because, yeah, we think of immortality as, you know, living forever, you know, vampires kind of thing. And immortality really here seems to mean living one's life completely. So living the number of years one is meant to live. Um, in the tantric works, it tends to be a hundred years or the full duration of someone's life. And that does seem to be the definition that they're working with here. So yeah, um, you know, I think there there's an idea that if you go through all 18 samskaras of the of preparing the mercury, that, you know, a physical immortality you know for the guy up in the, the woods up on the mountain is a possibility but it's not it's not really the goal chinese alchemy is very focused on living forever and immortality um, and here it's really more of a medical term of just a very long life hmm. Thank you. So if I may, a more related question is on, because in, in this text, uh, a diamond body is uh, mentioned quite frequently, I mean, the Vajradeha. So how do you understand this? Because I always thought it is it is the indestructible diamond body where in, in which the, the, the alchemist would uh, uh, or could uh, uh, live forever. Or, so you don't think that this is the, the idea of this uh, undestructible, uh, solid uh, diamond body? No, because uh, at least in what I've been reading, uh, that term doesn't come up. They're not, the, the immortality is always uh, in a list of physical ailments. So you've got, you know, fever, cough and then death right and so it's it's just trying to avoid illness cure illness um and yeah it's it's not really focused on that i mean there are parts that do talk about perfecting the body um but those are more kind of theoretical but when you're actually looking at the recipes themselves uh, because it just appears in this list of things like getting rid of gray hair um it seems to be quite a you know quite a, a earthly thing rather than some kind of supernatural existence great thank you Thanks very much. So the next question we got on the Slido uh, 
well okay we've got an anonymous one at the top i'll read that out first of all so from the 10th century onwards in e.g the rasarnava how do you disambiguate that rasa means mercury rather than one of the other physical or metaphysical meanings oh yeah Be well i mean it uh it becomes very clear because they use lots of terms for and it's not just rasa so parada comes up and then there's discussions of the you know the processes of mercury uh you know the the processing of it the samskaras so it, it is it is quite clear it's it's not ambiguous at all they you know they use other terms to make sure that you know that it's mercury and so when you have you know say you need the juice of a plant um they use a different term so they wouldn't use rasa there they would uh you know, use a term like for essence or, uh, you know, processed juiced plants. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's not ambiguous at all, which is quite helpful. <laughs> Great, thanks. And then next on the Slido, we've got uh, Jane Allred, please, if we could go to Jane. Oh, um, hi, Patricia. <laughs> My camera isn't ready, but um, I think the question speaks for itself. I was just wondering if like the texts say that, um, why, I forget the qualities, but why does a particular diamond with these qualities, why is it female? Or does it just simply describe, this is a female diamond and not say why? Yeah, it really just describes they're quite short verses. Um, but yeah, they just say, you know, the male diamond is the most radiant and beautiful, and it has these sharp edges, and then the female diamond is flat. <laughs> um, but it doesn't talk about why. It's really more focused on the importance of using the proper diamond for the proper patient. Um, because if you don't use the proper diamond for the proper patient, it either won't work right if it's too weak it's not going to work or if it's too strong it'll be too overpowering for the patient um, and that does like i said go along with all gems um, diamonds are also split into the four casts right so um, a brahmin can use any of the kinds of diamonds and be fine but obviously he wants the best um, but a lower caste person can't use a brahmin diamond because it'll be too powerful um but yeah as for why i don't know just the hierarchy you know <laughs> the, the male one's the best and the the non one is not the best lame all right <laughs> thanks <laughs> okay thanks uh and next can we go to ruth westerby please Hiya, thanks ever so much for that presentation. Really fascinating. I'm going to have to listen back through and make, make better notes on the sources. You mentioned um, reduction in ejaculation as one of the results that was um, uh, worked towards. I wondered whether there was any similar material on menstruation, um, whether there could be uh, an objective towards reducing menstruation, or does menstruation only occur in terms of uh, it, it's a good thing for it to be regular um, and also like and terminology and things like that. Um, and what exactly is are the fluids that are used? Is it is it menses? Is it menstrual blood or is there also sexual fluids as well? Thank you. Yeah, so there are there are I was actually quite delighted to find um, that there is a lot of focus on reducing the pain of menstruation. Um, so there you know, it's not just about, oh, menstruation's great. It, there are recipes to regulate it. Um, and yeah, to get rid of the pain is a, is a big focus, which, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that as a, as a menstruating person. I like that they're focused on, uh, yeah, women's health in general. It's not just about, women's health is not just about making women uh, appealing to men. It is also a very real topic um that acknowledges the very real issues that that these bodies go through so yeah that's that's nice um as for the substances it's kind of a mixture um but menstrual blood is used as, as a substance itself quite frequently uh this like the joined sexual fluids i haven't read 
all that much about it. I'm just not that interested in that aspect of these works. And they're so vast. I mean, there's so there's, you know, 40 texts that we have access to that haven't been edited, um, that are hundreds of verses long, right? So, um, you know, anything you're looking for, you could probably find somewhere in one of these works. Um, but I haven't really been too interested in uh, the sexual fluids, more of the, the women's health aspect to it. So I can't answer the second part of your question too much. Um, but yeah, I have been translating sections on women's health and seeing that there is a, a, a theme. The, the women's health sections are often kind of stuck in the middle of other things too. So you'll get like this whole thing about fevers and then suddenly it's like, oh, and here's how to you know, reduce pain and then it'll go back to something completely different and so they kind of get just like popped in there um there's not really like a chapter on women's health it's just kind of willy-nilly um which is not the case for the aphrodisiacs and the men's health they tend to be you know very structured in their own in their own context whereas these yeah they tend to get them just sort of popped in here and there Yeah, thanks. And, and we've got a couple of questions on the same theme. So one's anonymous. The next one, I'll read it out. Extending from Ruth's question to perhaps, I mean, well, I, I don't know if, if you've looked into all of this, but extending from Ruth's question, is menstrual fluid the only female substance relevant to these practices? Or is there any reference to other female substances? Um, I mean, I'm assuming other female substances would be thinking about like breast milk, perhaps. Um, so no, not that I've seen. Um, yeah, and then as with the, uh, you know, the sexual fluids, um, again, you know, I think it's there, but I haven't read too much about it. But yeah, it seems to be very largely focused on menstrual blood. Okay, uh, and then if we could go to Aggie Wittich, please, who's got a question on this topic. Yes, hello, uh, and thank you for a wonderful talk. You mentioned uh, what just uh, Ruth uh, asked about, uh, reducing menstrual pain. Could you elaborate a bit more on that? Is it recipes? Is it physical practices? Um, oh, yeah so yeah there's actual there's there's recipes um i'm trying let's see if i can pull up this chapter really quick uh but yeah there are actual recipes that are given uh let's see i'm just trying to see if i can find one really quickly Uh, yeah, so um, a woman should take a medicine using equal parts licorice, grass, uh, lodhra, and tele cherry bark, seed, ghee, shala tree resin, honey, fig tree, and the roots of moringa tree. Uh, crushing the ingredients, they're cooked with goat's milk, and a woman can drink this for seven nights, and this will cause her to menstruate. Um, and Causing a woman to menstruate is also considered to mark the beginning of her fertile cycle. So in regulating that menstruation, then you get a woman who, uh, you know, can, can give birth, um, but you also get rest. Yeah, I mean, uh, China flowers, China rose flowers, sour gruel. Um, drunk by a woman for three days. This causes a woman to become one who does not conceive. Um, so you also have that. I'm not, I can't find the one about the menstrual pain quickly. Um, but yeah, you just, you get recipes that are, are largely, um, largely herbal, uh, but you do occasionally get cinnabar put in there because cinnabar is, is thought to help women uh with menstruation and and with the pain specifically i think cinnabar is in that recipe okay thanks and uh, where's, uh and we've got another one from lubomir if we can go back to lubomir please 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, uh, where do you have noticed any influence of uh, Islamic alchemy on the practice of uh, Indian alchemists? Let, let's say, I mean, on the later text from 13th century, because in that time, uh, Islamic alchemy was, uh, I would say, extremely developed and advanced. And I would be surprised if there would be no, uh, no exchange between uh, uh, Muslim alchemists and Indian alchemists, but uh, I don't know anything about it. So did you notice any, any uh, any such exchange or, or, or mutual influence? Uh, so there's a really great article. I can't remember the writer's name, but I can send it to you. Um, that does talk about uh, the, the similarities. Um, I would also be shocked if there was no influence, especially because mercury doesn't occur naturally in India. So the mercury had to come from somewhere. Uh, and I assume along with that mercury came some knowledge. But these Sanskrit texts are very cautious about almost all only quoting each other. So they don't give credit to outside sources. Like there's that one reference to Tibetan Buddhists teaching the dying processes of mercury. And that's a very rare uh that's a very rare admission because they usually just ignore the other traditions as if they don't exist. And then, you know, and, and these texts, uh, especially the early ones are written in the same way as tantric texts, right? So they're revealed from Shiva himself, right? So Shiva's not gonna say, oh, and I got this, you know, we got this from these Muslims down the road. Um, so it's, it, it's hidden in that way. Um, so I think it's very deliberately not mentioned, and I don't know enough about Arabic uh, or Arabic alchemy to, you know, pull out those at this point. I do think there's definitely going to be some connections. Okay, thanks. Um, we've got a, two or three more in the slide. There's a couple of raised hands. Just if anyone wants, if the, if the hands are raised to ask questions, please put them on the Slido first. Okay. Um, we've got an anonymous one at the top. Do the text that you've surveyed prescribe postures, not necessarily asana in name, but assuming a particular bodily shape for medicinal purposes? That's a great question. Uh, I wish, but sadly, no. Um, not that I've found. If if I find some, that would be delightful. But uh, yeah, no, there doesn't seem to be a lot of connection between yogic practices or even those, you know, those tantric, like I'm thinking of the, the Nishwasa where, you know, the, the shape of the body is the shape of the letters. Uh, but yeah, we don't seem to find much it, you know these these therapies are quite physically demanding um you know you're eating mercury or diamond dust and then you know there's a lot of eating of sour gruels and geese to sort of get these medicines down and so i think you know my understanding is really that it's just about go into the the hut the rejuvenative therapy is taking these things there's a lot of purging um and then, you know, just eating bland foods in order to, to rebuild the body um, and just to feel better. But uh, yeah, not really any any positions that I've found. OK, thanks. I can add to that one possible connected. I mean, sort of the I think the the, uh, the questioner will be interested in the Kala Chakra Tantra, which does have our chemical material, mm -hmm. in it, doesn't it? And so that's we can probably we can date that fairly confidently to about 1030. And that mentions doing headstands if you've got an excess of kapha. And if I remember rightly, I think it's the lotus position, Padmasana, but it's probably called Vajrasana in the text for back pain. So that may be, I mean, that might be of interest to the questioner. Um, okay, back to the Slido. Next one is from Aaron Ulri. So if we could go to him, please. Hi there. Can you see me? Yes. All right. Yes. Um, so as you know, I work on um, magic <laughs> tantras, and you made this really interesting argument that you know they take vashikara, and I assume subjugation is the the one of the many shot karmanis that are actually found in these alchemy texts. I've speculated that vashikara is actually the one of the oldest 
of these uh, of these magical traditions and other ones evolved out of it. So my question is, and considering that these these tantric texts that I look at will throw in alchemy verses willy nilly, like just they're for all of the other results um, for lots of different results. So why do you think it was only Vashikarna? That's a great question. I I need a time machine to go ask an, an expert. Um, <laughs> I think Vashikarna, uh, it makes sense because it is it's more easily medicalized than some of the others, um, right? With, uh, you know, putting hexes on someone is not terribly medical. Mm. Although taking the dust of two fighting dogs to, to make a woman not sexually uh, active is uh, kind of a hex. <laughs> you know, it's, it's getting into that kind of more magical thing. There's nothing really medicinal about it. So you do mm -hmm. find things like that. But I think it's just because it's, it's so much more easily medicalized mm -hmm. than the others, you know, especially, you know, murder, you don't want to, you don't want to be known for making murder poisons. If you're also making health, right, health drink, you know, <laughs> Well, so, yeah, I, 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 I have arguments on that, but one thing you do see is with Stumbana, <laughs> there's tons of um, medical stuff and erotic stuff will be in Stumbana. So if you had said Vashikarna and, and Stumbana, I would have been like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Well, there's, there's, there is, there is some Stumbana as well. But yeah, it's, it's really, uh, you know, Millenbold really tries to make this strong claim that this chapter is all about all about the Sakharman and and it, mm -hmm. and it's very tantric. And then I looked into it and I'm like, this isn't tantric. This is just about sex, you know. Yeah. Um, so that was a, a, a stake. You know, the, the history of Indian medical literature is an absolutely incredible work. I mean, it's five volumes and it's just this insane encyclopedia. Um, it's it's a magical thing. But there are there are moments where I see some big problems such as just saying oh well this is very tantric or uh you know in the in the chapter that I was discussing on women's health he's he which talks a lot about um you know the suppression of ejaculation he yeah. he sums it up by talking about the first 30 verses which are all about the suppression of ejaculation and then mentions like two things about women's health and then is like etc and the vast majority of the the etc is the fascinating stuff about women's health and preventing pregnancy or causing pregnancy and all of these things and yeah he just kind of glosses it over like lady stuff <laughs> Thanks. Um, and Ruth's got another question. Can we go back to Ruth, please? Hi, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was about the stopping menstruation again. Sorry, just bashing on about the same thing. Yeah, you, so, so you said there are recipes for starting menstruation and that signals the beginning of a fertile period. So stop the stopping of menstruation, is there any indication of why you would want to do that? Is it full birth control or is it sort of a hex because you want somebody not to be fertile? And is there, I, I, I know it's so difficult to kind of relate the text to the social reality on the ground, but is there any indication of which of these recipes were more popular and sort of who was doing them and who was procuring them perhaps? That's that stuff. Oh, so okay. So the the second part of your question, uh, yeah, there's not a, there's not a ton, unfortunately, um, and because it's at such an early stage of looking at all these, I haven't had a chance to really compare recipes over various texts yet. Uh, but that is something that I plan to do because I think you know we'll probably see some repeated ones and. You know the things that get repeated are obviously the ones that are popular or, or stick around. Um, a couple of the texts do include, I mean quite a few of them include verses from other texts just taken wholesale, um, but then a few of them do say you know oh my my guru and I did this and this is you know we found it worked this way and so they, they are updating them a little bit now and again. Um, but as for which ones are most popular, I'm not sure. Uh, but yes, the, the stopping menstruation is very much about birth control. Uh, there's a lot of discussion of, um, of uh, you know, not conceiving. And one of the few references that it makes to, uh, you know, who would be using these is there's a very clear reference to giving it to a prostitute so that she does not get pregnant. 
um, because of course you don't want your side piece to mess up your whole your whole thing um so yeah so so we we do see that there's prostitution in here we do see that there are there are reasons to avoid um pregnancy and because there's this female alchemical assistant who can help make these things i i imagine that there's also probably you know just women who don't want to have any more children or don't want to have children using these things as well because there is only that one reference to a sex worker whereas most of it is just in in with the rest of women's health so it's like you know you can you can get pregnant or you cannot get pregnant and some of the some of the recipes to avoid con conception include herbs that are known now to cause abortion, but I don't know whether or not they were known at the time because the discussion of abortion is not in these texts. Um, Jang texts seem to mention it a bit and to not affect anything in the alchemical texts where they, they actually acknowledge um, abortion. It's more just then one won't become pregnant. Um, and I, but I do wonder whether or not they're meant to be taken, you know, perhaps when someone's a little pregnant, <laughs> rather than just before, in general. Okay, thank you. And we've got one last question on the Slido from uh, Conrad Elst. So if we could go to him, please. Well, I could just read it. So mercury and cinnabar were imported from China. Yes, alchemy existed for a thousand years. Yep. Uh, have come across any China link? No, that's that. And that's something that we're actively looking for um, is a link to China because it's it seems uh, it's impossible that there wouldn't be one because it was such a strong tradition in China. Um, because you do get those occasional references to Buddhism, um, you know, I think there is probably oral knowledge that's coming in and being written into the Sanskrit, but not being attributed. Um, but you also have that shift, right? In China, uh, mercury is associated with menstruation, cinnabar with uh, semen, and then they swap, right? They're, they're the opposite in India, which, you know, also I think indicates that there might have been some kind of some kind of discussion between the two, uh, but we we don't have any written evidence of that discussion. And they like said, you know, these Sanskrit texts are are very good about not including social and historical material, um, or even even references to outside the tradition. Right? They'll they'll take verses from say a tantric text and not not say where it's from. So you have to go back and find it yourself. Um, so yeah, they, they just would not, they just won't directly say like, oh, and then the Chinese taught us this. Um, but there are, there are a few scholars that are working on those connections. Um, you know, of course, just getting someone who knows Chinese, knows Sanskrit, and is interested in alchemy is, there's not a lot of those folks out there. Um, but hopefully, this will interest more people. And we can get some more of that cross cultural work done. Because I think, well, we will start to find connections eventually. It's just that right now, this this giant body of work uh, hasn't really been looked at all that much. Great. Well, thank you so much, Patricia. You've had a yeah, it's such a fascinating topic, which has uh, uh, led to lots of questions on many different different subjects. So, uh, and you've you've answered extremely deftly. Thanks. That was great. 